Hello, I'm doing a book review, and the book I want to review is the sixth and final volume of Akita. Now, Akita is a six-volume manga series. A manga is a Japanese comic book or graphic novel, and the series was written and illustrated by Katsuhiro Otomo, and the series was published between the years 1982 and 1990. Now, even though the series itself was completed in 1990, it of course was originally published in single magazine form, so this particular volume of the series wasn't published until 1993. Now, the series was adapted into the anime film of the same name in 1988, so the movie came out before the series was even completed, and years before this volume was actually published. Now, I'm just going to do a brief recap of all the volumes leading up to this, and I am going to be skipping over a lot of stuff, because honestly, there's just too much to cover, because this entire manga series is put together 2,000 pages long, so obviously I'm going to be glossing over some stuff. I'm just going to lay out a basic outline of the plot leading up to this volume. Now, this entire series is set nearly four decades after World War III, and in the story you find out that prior to the war, there was this top-secret experiment sanctioned by the Japanese government where they were experimenting on children with psychic abilities. And one of the children they were experimenting on was a young boy named Akita, who for some reason nobody was ever able to explain. He basically gained the powers of a god. And Akita's powers triggered an explosion, which destroyed the city of Tokyo and started World War III. And nearly 40 years later, the world has mostly rebuilt itself, and the city of Tokyo has been replaced with Neo-Tokyo, but this psychotic teenager named Tetsuo Shima starts developing telekinetic powers very similar to that of Akita. And Tetsuo ends up waking Akita up. And basically, Akita causes another explosion to happen, very much like the one that destroyed the original Tokyo, this one destroying Neo-Tokyo. So, in the final three volumes of this series, basically volumes four, five, and this one, the city of Neo-Tokyo is in ruins, and the survivors of Akita's attack on Neo-Tokyo have broken up into two different factions. One faction is this group of people trying to start their own nation called the Great Tokyo Empire, with Akita as its emperor and Tetsuo as Akita's right-hand man. And the other faction is led by this old priestess named Lady Miyako, who you find out is actually a psychic herself. So that's just the whole story leading up to this. Obviously, I skipped over a lot. Like, I didn't even mention Kanida and Kei and a bunch of the other characters who do play big parts in this final volume. I just wanted to give a basic outline of the plot leading up to this. Now, Akita Volume 6 is an amazing conclusion to an already amazing series. And one thing you might notice in this video is, in a lot of ways, this video is going to be more of my thoughts on the series overall more so than my thoughts of this particular volume. But overall, I thought this series was really freaking impressive. Now, I'm not a big fan of mangas and anime. Like, I'm actually very much a novice when it comes to uh, mangas and anime. But this story really blew me the fuck away. And I genuinely loved all six volumes of this series. And looking at this series as one whole story, this is, this might go down as one of, if not my, it's definitely not one of my top 15 favorite books of all time, but if I ever did like a list of my top 25 or 20 favorite books of all time, this will definitely go on that list, I think. Like, this series really was a hell of a journey, and I actually read this series twice. The first time I read it was when I was reading each individual volume and then doing reviews on them, but then recently, before I did my reviews of these final three volumes, I actually reread the entire series 
send, when I reread it, I only read it in, like, a couple of days. Like, the pacing of this series is almost ridiculously quick, yet it never feels like he's rushing you. Like, it never feels like Otomo is rushing the story or skipping over important details. It still feels like a whole and complete story, and it's an epic story, yet at the same time, though, it moves at such a brisk pace. And I honestly recommend this series for anybody, even if you're not a fan of mangas and anime. And once again, I'm not a big manga person or anime person, and I absolutely adored this story. I think I can recommend this for anybody who's into good storytelling. And another thing I love about this is it combines so many different genres. It's a science fiction story, it's a dystopian story, it's a cyberpunk story, it's a post-apocalyptic story, and yes, I know, all those genres I mentioned are basically just subgenres of science fiction, but it's also a horror story, it's a political drama, it's a political thriller, it's a character drama, there's a lot of political satire in this, there's a lot of dark humor in this, like, there are so many different genres at work in this story, yet it never feels like the story is just this twisted amalgamation of all these different genres. All the genres work in tandem with each other. There are even some elements of the superhero genre in this. Once again, there's so many different genres at work, almost to a point where the story seems to defy genre and defy classification. So, the plot of Volume 6 of Akira is it picks up right where Volume 5 left off, following this epic battle between Tesuo and Kei. Now, Kei is a psychic medium who could actually channel the powers of other psychics through her, and she more or less gets possessed by Lady Miyako and the Espers, and they use their powers through her against Tesuo. And it turns out that Tesuo is getting so powerful that he could potentially destroy the human race as we know it, and also his body is starting to physically change because his body can't handle his powers anymore, and throughout the story he starts to mutate into this blob-like creature. Meanwhile, you have Kanida, who is Tesuo's former best friend, turned arch-enemy, who him and a few other characters launch this assault against the Great Tokyo Empire. Meanwhile, you have the United States military launching an assault on Neo-Tokyo just to get at Tesuo and Akita. And basically, it just becomes all-out war on all sides, and at a certain point, Kanida and a few other characters do get their hands on Akita, because Akita is not necessarily evil. If anything, Akita is more neutral, like, it really doesn't matter to him. And it's really in this volume of the series where the story becomes an almost David Cronenberg-level body horror story. And once again, not just is this a great volume, but the whole series overall is just fantastic, in my opinion. Especially the characterization. There's a lot of really rich characterization throughout this whole series, especially with the character of Tesuo, because even though Tesuo is the main villain of this story, he's still a very three-dimensional character and is even a sympathetic character to a certain extent. Especially, there's this really heartbreaking moment in the story between Tesuo and this girl named Cody, and I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right, but throughout the story, the two of them develop this really strange relationship with each other, but by the end of their relationship, you come to realize that, holy shit, Tesuo genuinely cared for this girl. Now, yes, their relationship was definitely fucked up, especially because Cody started out as one of Tesuo's sex slaves, but as time went on, it seemed like the two did develop a genuine love for each other. Well, I'm not sure if it was really love on Cody's part, or more like Stockholm Syndrome. And also, towards the end of this story, there's actually a part where Kanida more or less gets sucked into Tesuo's mind and his memories, and there's almost a moment of understanding where Kanida starts to understand why Tesuo is the way he is. 
And Kaneda is a great character as well because he's a very humorous character and he adds a lot of humor and levity to what is overall a pretty dark story. And throughout this entire series, you see this character very much mature because in the beginning of the series, he's kind of just a snot-nosed kid, but you come to really like this character as the series goes on, and this character really goes through a genuine arc throughout this entire story. Another character who really fascinates me from this story is the Colonel, who in the beginning of this series is kind of a villain, but he becomes a real really awesome character by the end of this whole story, and there's a genuinely touching moment between the Colonel, Kanida, and Kay at the end of the story. And even the side characters get their own moments to shine as well. Like, there's this character named Joker, not to be confused with the Joker from the Batman comics, that's a completely different character, but this Joker is a really interesting character, or just a really awesome character, especially Especially because him and Kanida are constantly bickering with each other because they used to be enemies, and Joker is not really a good person at all. At the same time, though, he becomes a really freaking awesome character in this story. But then you have the character of Kay, who in my opinion is the true protagonist of this story, and she's just such an awesome character. She's a very strong character, she's a very, she honestly, she's a freaking badass throughout most of this series, and she really does go through a real arc throughout this entire series, especially considering that she's so important in the battle against Tessuo, and once again, Tessuo could potentially destroy the human race race as we know it, but to swing this back to the side characters, once again, even the side characters get their own moments to shine. For example, there are certain points in volumes 5 and 6 of this series that focus on this group of scientists from different countries who are trying to study Akira and Tesuo, and you come to really like these characters as well, and you start to see a real kinship between these scientists. Now, this entire series is very, very political, and this volume is no exception, and in this volume in particular, it seems to be very critical of the United States' involvement with Japan following the Second World War, and I could see some people maybe having a problem with that, depending on what your personal views on that actually are. I didn't really have a problem with that, because, you know what? I feel like art is meant to challenge you to a certain extent, and you don't have to agree with the artist's political views 100% in order to enjoy the art, and even though it is a very fun story, it's also a very political story, and it touches on much deeper political and social themes. And I definitely feel like the fictional post-World War III Japanese society of this story is very much a metaphor for post-World War II Japanese society. And also, it's impossible to look at the destruction that Akira causes to both Tokyo and Neo-Tokyo in this story without also thinking about the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it's so clear that Akira is meant to be sort of a metaphor for the atomic bomb. And once again, there are so many of these political and social themes throughout the story, and as I mentioned before, the story is definitely kind of critical of the United States government's, like, involvement with the Japanese government following the Second World War, and once again, depending on what your feelings towards that actually are, I could see some people having a problem with that, but I think you could still enjoy the story even if you don't personally agree with Otomo's views on that. And there are so many other themes in this story besides even that, like, there's a lot of commentary on religion in this story, and belief systems, and faith, and what we put our faith in. There's even this whole idea in the story that what if Akira is actually a vessel for the very essence of the universe itself? What if he's even God incarnate? 
And the fact that Akira is more or less neutral in this story, I think, is very important because, like, even though the quote-unquote bad characters in this story worship Akira and use him as sort of a representation of their actions, they probably would have done that with or without Akira, and Akira didn't really seem to have a say in that, and it kind of brings to mind, like, people who kill in the name of God, when if there is a God, I would like to think that God would be upholded by something like that. But then again, nobody really knows what God would really be like, and how the fuck do we know that God would even remotely give a shit about what our personal views are? And this whole idea of the Great Tokyo Empire using Akita as an excuse to do what they're doing definitely brings to mind religious fanaticism. And even though this is a science fiction story, and there is sort of a, granted it is pseudoscience, but there is sort of a scientific explanation for what's happening in the story, there's still this level of mysticism about it and spirituality, and even towards the end of this story, certain characters ascend to what could be interpreted as sort of an afterlife. Once again, there are so many deeper themes in this story about politics, about religion, and it's just a great story overall. But yeah, I highly recommend this series. I would say I highly recommend Volume 6, but obviously you have to read the first five volumes in order to understand this one. And overall, I think this is just a great series, and overall it tells just an amazing science fiction story. So yeah, that was my review on Volume 6 of Katsuhiro Otomo's Akita, and my next review will be a review on the movie Akita.